If I told you there was a simple and scientific way to prevent you from getting sick and improve the health of your blood vessels and your heart and also improve the amount of oxygen that's going to your cells and your organs, you'd probably think I'm trying to sell you a drug. But there is a natural molecule that our body produces that can do all of this and more. It's called nitric oxide. So I'm going to go over exactly what nitric oxide is and I'm going to go over how you can get more of that in your body. Nitric oxide comes from the molecule nitroglycerin. Now outside of the body, nitroglycerin is very different and it's actually used to make explosives like dynamite. But inside the body, surprisingly, it's very beneficial. Now, until the 1980s, it was considered a very toxic substance. So medicine would just dismiss the thought of using something like nitroglycerin inside the body. But it turns out that inside the body, it converts to the molecule nitric oxide, which is very beneficial and it's very good for our heart and our cardiovascular system. Now you might not have heard of this because in the field of medicine, nitric oxide is still very new. So nitric oxide is a very powerful molecule and it does two major things. The first is it is an antibacterial meaning it can fight off bacteria and fight off infections and prevent you from getting sick. And the second is, it is a vasodilator. That means it sends a signal to our blood vessels for them to relax and dilate. And by doing so, it increases our blood flow and it increases the amount of oxygen and blood that is going to our cells and our organs. Now it's also important for our gas exchange that happens in our lungs. Because just like it dilates our blood vessels, it also dilates our air passages. So it makes that gas exchange easier. And it's also good for athletes because nitric oxide has been shown to improve athletic performance. Because athletes who have more nitric oxide are gonna get tired less easily and they're gonna have a higher VO2 max. And that's basically a measure of an athlete's fitness. It's also very good for as we age. Because as we get older, our blood vessels get more and more stiff. And this is why as we get older, diseases that are related to reduced blood flow are more common one of them being erectile dysfunction. And this is why drugs like Viagra are so popular because they help dilate those blood vessels. And you're also more likely to get cancer as you get older. And surprisingly, eight out of 10 of the most common cancers happen because there is reduced blood flow to an organ. So what happens is when you don't have enough nitric oxide, your blood vessels constrict. And that means that your heart has to work harder and pump up the pressure so that it can send enough of that blood to all the right places. And that means that your blood pressure is gonna go up. You know, it's kind of like if you're watering your garden with a garden hose and you start constricting that hose at the end. What's gonna happen is that water pressure has to go up so that it can distribute all that water accordingly. Now the problem with high blood pressure or hypertension is that it can start to damage our arteries. And over time, it can lead to a buildup of plaque and cholesterol and potentially cause a blockage or an obstruction which can lead to a heart attack or a stroke. Now even if you don't have high blood pressure, increasing your nitric oxide can still help you because not only is it a natural defense against heart attacks, it also ensures we're getting enough blood flow throughout our body and helps ensure that our organs and our cells are getting enough oxygen. So how do we get more nitric oxide? Well, I'm gonna go over five ways you can increase your nitric oxide. The first is gonna be nasal breathing, using your nose to breathe. So nitric oxide is produced in our blood vessels, and that includes our paranasal sinuses. And every time we breathe in through our nose, our air passes through these paranasal sinuses. So as our air enters our paranasal sinuses, they release this nitric oxide and that actually enters the air that then goes to our lungs. And from there, our lungs have this gas exchange that happens and then that air enters our lungs and now we get nitric oxide in our bloodstream. Now the cool thing about this is as this nitric oxide is in this nasopharynx area as we're breathing through our nose, it can help keep that nasopharynx area clean. So what does that mean? That means you are way less likely to get things like tonsil and adenoid infections. Your tonsils and adenoids are basically these lymph tissues that are in the back of your throat. And I can't tell you how many times in my practice, 
that I see people that have these large tonsils and adenoids. And it's usually because their tonsils and their adenoids are not being kept clean. And it's because they don't have enough of this nitric oxide that's keeping that area bacteria free. Now this usually happens in people that chronically breathe through their mouth. Because when you breathe through your mouth, your paranasal sinuses aren't getting activated, so your air does not get any of that nitric oxide. So that means that that air that surrounds our tonsils and our adenoids is gonna be way more damaging and way more likely to cause an infection or cause those tonsils and adenoids to swell up. So when you're breathing, you wanna focus on really gentle, calm breathing in and out through your nose. Now something else to tie in to your nasal breathing is practicing a breath hold after an exhale. So holding your breath specifically after an exhale will do a couple of things and it'll also increase your nitric oxide. So first of all, when you're holding your breath, it'll build up more of that nitric oxide in your nasal cavity area. So that way when you inhale again through your nose, more of that nitric oxide is gonna be entering that air and entering your lungs. Now the other cool thing with breath holding is it actually lowers the oxygen saturation in your body. Now you might be wondering like, wait, hold on, that sounds like a bad thing. Well, here's the thing, you're lowering the amount of oxygen in your body temporarily, but in the long run, you'll actually be increasing the amount of oxygen carriers that go to your cells. So as you're holding your breath, you're also increasing the amount of CO2 or carbon dioxide in your body. And doing so, first of all, that increases the amount of hemoglobin in your body. So your hemoglobin is what your oxygen attaches to when you inhale. So as you breathe in, that oxygen attaches to that hemoglobin and the hemoglobin kind of acts like a train and it delivers that oxygen to all of your cells. But also when you practice a breath hold, it causes your spleen to start producing more red blood cells. And also on top of that, your kidneys will start secreting more something called erythropoietin or EPO. And your erythropoietin will also help mature even more red blood cells. So all of these things combined will help carry and deliver more oxygen to your cells. So basically when you're holding your breath, you're temporarily depriving your body of oxygen, but you're allowing your body to build up more and more of these trains to allow more oxygen to be delivered everywhere it needs to go. Now this is the same thing that happens when people go to higher altitudes to train. And this is why athletes go to the mountains or go to places like Colorado to go train for a big event. But you don't have to go to those mountains. You can do that high altitude training at your own house by practicing this breath holding. So how do you practice this? Well, you don't wanna hold your breath until you're dying to take the next breath. You wanna hold your breath until you have about a medium to strong urge to breathe. And then you're gonna recover by breathing through your nose. The trick to see if you held your breath for a good amount of time is as you're recovering, it should only take you about one to two breaths to recover and resume normal breathing. If you feel like you're dying and you have to take more than two breaths to recover your breathing, then you held your breath too long. Now, the more you practice these breath holds, the less your body is gonna require oxygen for day-to-day -day tasks. And the reason is your body is gonna be way more efficient in how it utilizes its oxygen. So that means that next time you have to require more oxygen, like next time you're going on a run, then you're gonna be at a way higher advantage compared to someone who hasn't been practicing this breath holding. Now number two, and the second way to get more nitric oxide is by exercising. Now the thing is you can actually tie in the first one, which is nasal breathing, into your exercise if you really wanna maximize the amount of nitric oxide that you're getting. Now we all know exercise is important, but which type of exercise is best to maximize your nitric oxide? So there was a study addressing this. So this study is from researchers at the Hiroshima Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. And what they were doing is they were comparing different intensities of exercise and comparing the amount of blood flow that you get from each intensity. And the reason that that's really important for your nitric oxide is because when your blood flow increases, it stimulates your blood vessels to produce more of this nitric oxide. So they were basically comparing three different intensities. One was a very low intensity that was basically comparable to window shopping. And the second was a moderate intensity exercise. And the third was a very high intensity, almost all out exercise. What they found is the low intensity exercise really wasn't enough to stimulate an increased amount of blood flow. At the same time, the high intensity exercise actually did the opposite. It actually lowered the amount of blood flow. But moderate intensity exercise was that sweet spot. And that was very good at 
increasing your blood flow and increasing the nitric oxide. So what exactly is a moderate intensity exercise? Well, that would be something called zone two training. So different workouts and different intensities are classified by different zones. Now different coaches use different metrics for these zones, but basically zone one is gonna be really easy and that's gonna be that window shopping. And zone five, or whatever the highest zone is, is gonna be super intensity and that's gonna be that all out workout or the all out sprint. Zone two training would be exercising in a way where it's hard to maintain a full conversation but you can still do it. So if you're going for a walk in the park and you're having a really easy conversation with someone, then that would be zone one. But if you're going for a slight jog in the park now and that conversation is getting a little more difficult, but you can still have a full conversation, now you're in zone two. But if it's really hard to maintain that conversation and you can't really have a full conversation, now you're entering zone three. So zone two is gonna be different for everyone. It depends on your fitness level. So for some people, it will be a slight jog in the park. And for other people, it will just be simply going for a normal walk. And the other cool thing about zone two training is that it can actually help you live longer and healthier. Now I talk more about zone two training and other exercises to help you live longer and live healthier. And I'm putting a link to that video in the description below. So make sure you check that out. Now number three in the third way to increase your nitric oxide is by humming. Yes, you heard that right. A really interesting article from the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine found that people who hum versus people who just have a normal exhale can produce about 15 times more nitric oxide. Now when you think about it, it's really no surprise because a lot of your nitric oxide is produced in your paranasal sinuses. And when you start humming, you start vibrating your palate and your whole upper airway area. And that will also stimulate your paranasal sinuses to produce more nitric oxide. And if you think about it more, now it's no surprise why humming is so popular in those ancient meditation techniques. So does that mean that every single breath you have to start humming for the rest of your life? Mm. No, but this is a cool, simple trick that you can start practicing when you have nothing else to do, like when you're driving to work or if you're trying to annoy your friends. Now, we talked a lot about certain tricks to increase your nitric oxide, but what about foods you can directly eat to increase your nitric oxide? A lot of athletes swear by eating foods that are high in nitrates because they are so confident that it can improve their performance and also reduce their cramping. Now, nitrate is usually a preservative. So when you eat a food that has a high amount of nitrate, it's then converted into nitrite, and then once it gets to your stomach, it's then converted into nitric oxide. So one food that has a high amount of nitrates is beets. So this review was looking at athletes who supplement with beetroot juice to see how it affects their performance. What they found is chronic supplementation, or taking beetroot juice for a longer period of time, will improve athletic performance and also improve VO2 max. And it also said if you're doing it specifically for athletic performance, you should take it within 90 minutes of doing your exercise or your performance. Because the peak value of nitrate in your body happens about two to three hours after ingesting it. So to maximize the benefits for whatever workout or competition you're doing, have it within 90 minutes of that exercise. Now, if you wanna take beetroot juice, how much of it do you need to drink? So this other study was also looking at people who were taking beetroot juice as a supplement. So there were two different groups. So there were a group of men between 19 and 38, and one group drank two cups of beetroot juice for a week, and the other group was a control group. So to quote the study, for the people that drank the beetroot juice, there was a remarkable reduction in the amount of oxygen required to perform an exercise versus the control group. And part of the study also had the participants cycling. And the people that drank the beetroot juice were able to cycle 16% longer before getting tired. And also the blood pressure of the people that drank the beetroot juice dropped and it was still within normal levels. And at the end of the study, the researchers concluded that this increase in performance could not be explained by any other means than simply drinking the beetroot juice. So what are some other foods that are high in nitrates and can get you this benefit of more nitric oxide? Well, other foods you wanna eat are leafy greens like spinach and kale. Both of those are high in nitrates. Some other ones are also fish, dark chocolate, pomegranate juice, green and black tea, and also 
oatmeal. Now the last thing on my list, the fifth way to get more nitric oxide is to avoid processed foods and alcohol. Now I'm not talking about all processed foods because even some vegetables are processed. But by processed foods I mean refined grains and refined carbohydrates. Both these sugars, refined grains, and alcohol can damage our arteries and limit our production of nitric oxide. So that means that even if we do all these other things that are benefiting us and getting more nitric oxide, if we do these bad things by eating these refined grains and drinking this alcohol, it's going to negate a lot of those benefits that we get. So this study actually found that drinking alcohol actually impairs the bioavailability of nitric oxide in our body. So that means that even if we have nitric oxide in our body, we're not actually benefiting from it. And this other study was actually comparing healthy people when they had an alcoholic beverage at dinner time versus just having water at dinner time. After just one hour, the people who had alcohol with their dinner had significantly lower concentrations of nitric oxide versus the people that just drank water. So I know it sucks, but if you want to maximize your nitric oxide, avoid that alcohol. Now what is the best way to time your naps? And how long should your naps actually be if you want to maximize or optimize their naps the best way possible? Well, in a nutshell, you don't want your naps to be too long and you don't want them to be too late into the evening. So if it's your regular everyday nap that you're doing, it's best if you keep it in the 